Okay, chapter 21, an emerging world power, 1890 to 1918. So, you know, still in the thick of the Industrial Revolution, but also the progressive reforms. 1918 is, is significant in history as the end of World War One. So this chapter will take us through World War One. okay? So in an emerging world power, uh, America is being seen now as, as, a, as a power to be reckoned with, okay? Uh, in this era, they're not quite the world power that, that they are today, but they're on their way, okay? So, so what does an emerging power need? You, you need land. You need overseas holdings. I mean, you, you need access to the world, right? If you want to... If you want to be a world power, you, you've got to be have some strength around the world. OK, so you become imperialistic. So as they emerge, um, they, they look to other places for territories. OK, and we've talked about some of these. Um, so imperialism, you become imperialistic. What is that? The policy of extending the rule or authority of an empire or nation over foreign countries or of acquiring and holding colonies and dependencies through diplomacy or military force. Okay. Okay. So let's let's look at that a little bit. Um, extend the rule or authority over a foreign country. Uh, acquire, hold colonies and dependencies. You either do it nicely through diplomacy, or maybe not so nicely, but but you know without without bloodshed perhaps, or by military force. This is a aggressive idea. You're conquering. Why are you doing that? Because you want to be a world power, and you've got to have places to stop with your ships. This is before airplanes, you know, where you can fly around the world now. But in those days, you couldn't. So you had to do it by ship. So you got to have places to resupply, especially coal. We talked about that before. Yeah, but but also to 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 have a presence, you know, uh, show the world that that you're out there. And and Teddy Roosevelt in the in his time sent the United States Navy around the world. Uh, through the Panama Canal, which was one of his babies, and he painted all the ships white to, to show the world, you know, the the might of the of the American military. Okay, so so imperialism is a big deal. Um, acquiring and holding colonies. We talked about what colonies are in the past. Not not a vacation. Not not a nice visit. You're coming to take advantage of the land. Get you know uh, get the resources out of the land. And how do you do that? You subjugate the people that are living there as a labor force and, and, and you know, force them to, to do that, okay? So, so this is not a pretty thing, okay? Okay, so we remember the Treaty of Kanagawa, uh, this idea that the United States wanted to, to open trade with Japan, who was isolationist at that time. Japan said, no, we don't want to. We, we're happy in our closed society uh, so America shows up with military might in their harbor and somewhat forces them to open trade, allow their ships to resupply. There, this this goes back to 1854, seven years before the Civil War. We talked about William Seward, a, uh, a, a expansionist, manifest destiny type of politician, promoted a presence in the Caribbean, Philippines, Hawaii, Panama Canal, Alaska. Okay, so this is kind of America's you know, character as the 20th century approaches. Expansion, expansion around the world. Not, you know, we, we've done the manifest destiny thing, sea to shining sea on the continent of the United States. Let's keep going, okay? But not everybody uh, agreed or, you know, uh, gave, it, gave this idea um, any support. This is, a, you know, William Jennings Bryan, uh, famous for running for president a few times and never winning, but also the, uh, the pro- Evolution. I'm sorry, procreation lawyer in the uh, Scopes Monkey Trial. Okay, so he's against this. He, he's an opponent to imperialism and expansion. God Himself placed in every human heart the love of liberty. He never made a race of people so low on the scale of civilization or intelligence that it would welcome a foreign master. So, who's the foreign master? America. It, it, is that who America wants to be? Is, is that what all these cornerstone values and and you know sac sacred uh, beliefs and ideologies you know is, is that what America's about to become a foreign master and and dominate you know people worldwide so people people have a 
you know, some people have a negative reaction to this, okay? But for the most part, the American people at the turn of the 20th century supported the President McKinley, okay? He's an expansionist, okay? This is before Roosevelt came in. And this is an era known for or called, you know, this era of American exceptionalism. Okay? This idea that America is the best and the people are the best and everything, you know, about America is, is the top. So ethnocentric, right? Uh, from your book, the United States has a unique destiny to foster democracy and civilization on the world stage. I mean, it sounds like manifest destiny to me, but now it's on the world stage. So, so the manifest destiny idea keeps going. Okay, another quote from your book: "Besides strong a minister, the American Anglo-Saxon race, the white people, represented the highest liberty, the purest Christianity, the highest civilization, and would spread itself over the earth." So. Again, what's that sound like? Manifest destiny. It still goes on today. The manifest destiny has not stopped. So here you see evidence of this, okay? Um, this ethnocentrism, uh, the idea that the Anglo-Saxon race, and now uh, we talked about it with Teddy Roosevelt being a wasp, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, okay? Uh, the, the, the white Anglo-Saxon race as being, you know, superior to any other people uh, on the planet in the world, especially people of color, okay? So, you know, you, you ask the question about American racism, it's, it's history with racism. I mean, how, how much evidence do we need, right? You can look across the entirety of American history, and it's obvious that this ideology is a strong foundation, okay? Uh, and, you know, you, you see it by the way people were treated. There's evidence of, of ill treatment. And, and we've gone over this before, but, you know, I really can't stress how important it is. Maybe the most important thing in this course is how people were treated in, in, in this advancement of these people, okay? Native Americans by the turn of the 20th century were nearly gone, you know, hanging by a thread on reservations. No, no real political power, no, no clout at all. African Americans had been enslaved, but free, but then not not really free. We talked about that reconstruction controlled by Jim Crow laws in the South, right? Uh, and they had little opportunity in the North. Okay, Hispanic people, uh, you know, had a huge part of of their country taken from them in Mexico. Uh, in the Mexican American War, the Mexican cession lands were taken from them by manufactured war. Once they became their, their home became part of America, they were excluded from uh, from having access to opportunity, right? Many, many were killed. They, it was kind of open season on, on um, Mexican people. They wanted to get rid of them. If you recall, there was talk about, um, you know, an annexing all of Mexico after the Mexican-American War, uh, but but the government decided that, you know, we really don't want that many non-white people in our country. So, you know, Mexico came very close to becoming part of the United States way back. OK. OK, so can you, you know, but I'm, I'm sorry, Asians were excluded from coming to the country at all after being a huge part of the labor force in the 19th century. Now excluded, especially Chinese and women of every color. Every income forced by society, stay in the home, don't venture out. It's a man's world out there. You are not, you know, made to survive that. You don't have the emotional makeup. You're, you're, you're nervous and, and you know, uh, frivolous. And you're, you're, you're not, you know, built to handle the kind of challenge that we have to face every day. So don't venture out. Okay, all, all, these, all these ideas are very American, okay? So can you get get an idea how racism was formed in this country and how white supremacy became so popular? And again, even though the Reconstruction Amendments, Bill of Rights, voting law, say it isn't so. If you don't enforce those laws, people do whatever they want. OK, OK, let's take a break here and, and watch our first film. OK, uh, now this is a crash course films. So I'm not sure. I, I don't I'm not sure if we've seen one yet in this class or not, but I do like like to show these films on occasion. Uh, these are documentaries in a, in a much more modern format. OK, very funny, um, uh, irreverent, perhaps uh, making fun of history, but in a funny way. Uh, but I, I do believe that the content of these is very good. Uh, one of the things I do like about Crash Course Films is it's not Eurocentric. It's not it's not 
all, always given from the point of view of the white of the white man. All races and genders are given equal time here. So that's why I like to watch these films. Okay. So please watch the, the film entitled American Imperialism Crash Course U.S. History Number 28. Okay. Okay. Uh, Let's do a supplemental election number seven here. So we have this one and one more to go before our midterm. <clears throat> this is entitled Roosevelt and the War of 1898. Okay. So just a sidebar before we get started. Uh, this war used to be called the Spanish-American War. So, so for, uh, many of you probably have heard of that before. It is now called the War of 1898. Why Why is that? Well, we, we live in this era of political correctness, Right. PC. Not everybody likes that. Uh, the reason why this the, the title of this war has changed because Cubans fought in this war also, and they don't get mentioned in, in that Spanish-American War name. So it's now called the War of 1898. Now, they're not mentioned there either, so I'm not sure what they accomplished, but you know, no, nobody asks me. <laughs> no one asks my opinion about these things. Okay, so what is this war about? Um, this War of, of 1898 uh, what, what is it about? It's in response to the vicious treatment of Cuban patriots who were fighting Spain for independence. So in Cuba, there's a war going on between the Cubans, the, the native people, fighting for their independence from Spain, much like America did with, with England, right? Uh, you know, what, 130 years prior. Um, so uh, this war is going on, this, this battle for independence, and Spain is treating the Cuban patriots pretty badly, okay? Uh, and this is what gets America involved in this war, the Spanish-American War, the War of 1898, as it's called today, okay? And I mentioned before about yellow journalists, well, William Randolph Hearst. He, he promotes this idea of fighting against Spanish abuses against the Cubans. And this, you know, people get emotional, and, and, and the country gets whipped into a nationalistic, patriotic fervor. Let's, let's go down to Cuba and and smote the Spanish, these nasty people that are that are treating the Cubans so poorly. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> which of course you know the the obvious question it begs the obvious question. You know why all the sympathy for the Cubans when black people in the Jim Crow South in your own country could certainly use some sympathy and a break. But you know you're worried about about Cubans in another country, but not worried about people in your own country. But but let's go save the Cubans. Now under, don't misunderstand me. Nothing against Cubans. Not not at all what I'm saying. But you get my point. You know, worried about somebody else because a newspaper fires you up about let's go save them, but you don't give a damn about the people in your own country. Okay, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So, um, you know, creating sympathy for an oppressed people is a good way to get people fired up, and it works. But, but Hearst goes further and challenges men. Men need to become men again. You know, you've gotten too soft in the industrial age. You know, so he questions American. He questioned American men's manhood, and what what better way to prove your manhood? Let's go fight a war, okay? Now. Teddy Roosevelt's a perfect example of this need to show that you are a man. Now, he is very famous in, in, in history for his raid on San Juan Hill in this war, okay? <clears throat> and this is one of those hallowed moments, uh, that you, you know, like the Alamo, Custer's Last Stand, uh, that, that, that America looks to with, you know, a patriotic, glow, right? But but again, we talked about the other two, the Alamo and Custer's Last Stand, the real story. San Juan Hill is also one of those embellished moments that have become known as a hallowed moment in American history, okay? So, so when the war broke out, um, Petty was his, his position, he was the assistant to the Navy, and he, and he quit that job to go and create a regiment of volunteers to go fight the war. And this is where the Rough Riders come from, okay? Uh, his, now, the, their, their combat experience in this war would amount to one week and only one day of actual fighting. But the battle was significant. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, San Juan Hill was a fortified position. It was high ground in, in, in these days of battle before airplanes. Uh, you know, uh, an, a... a, a a, a person or a, an army that, that held the high ground had an advantage. 
especially if it's if you're fortified. In other words, you're you're behind defensive works. Your opponent can can be much bigger, have many more troops, but they they have to advance on a fortified position so that you you can wipe them out because you're shooting down at them from the high ground. They have to come up a hill, okay? Uh, so without question, San Juan Hill was a successful attack on a and on the enemy's position on high ground, uh, and Roosevelt's regiment was part of of the taking of this fortified position. Okay, they were on the right side of the attack and they made it to the top. There's no question about it. Okay, uh, but they're on foot. Okay, now what doesn't look like they're on foot there? This image has them on horses, and any image you see of San Juan Hill, and you can search it, Google it, uh, you'll, they're always on horses, rushing up the hill, these heroic, you know, um, Americans coming to save the day, okay? But but no, they were mostly on foot. Why? Because uh, when they departed from Tampa, Florida, okay, uh, many of the horses were left behind. They forgot to load the horses. <laughs> so they got to Cuba and said, where are the horses? Well, well, I think we left them behind. So there are only a few horses, okay? So they didn't they didn't ride up the hill, they ran up the hill, okay? Although every image of this of this uh, incident shows them on horseback, okay? But Teddy thought it was a great a great moment. You know, he called it a charge, even though no horses were there. The charge itself was great fun. And oh, but we had a bully fight. So he's pretty happy with himself. In fact, he earned a recommendation for the Congressional Medal of Honor, and of course he was quite pleased. Now, for any of you that have been in the military, you know that the Congressional Medal of Honor is the highest award you can give a military person. Okay? And they're typically given to people that that you know go above and beyond what their normal duties are. Okay, and I understand normal duties mean you're going to be in combat, you're going to take fire, you're going to charge. You're going to retreat. You're 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 you're, you're going to be fighting and potentially being killed. But, but those those are normal duties. That, that's what war is. The Congressional Medal of Honor goes to someone who does something that is extremely her heroic. Many times saving people. Uh, many times you know uh, unlodging an enemy from a position. And many times these these awards are given posthumously after after death because they're killed in the event that gets them the the Medal of Honor. So people question, well, wait a minute, what, what did Roosevelt do? He was, he was at the, at the battle. He went up the hill. The, the, uh, his, the American forces were successful in taking the position. He was there, but so were a lot of other people. What, 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 what made his, you know, his, his behavior stand out to give him the Congressional Medal of Honor. It didn't make any sense to some people. So politics intervened, and the request was denied, and this crushed him. He was crushed, okay? But, but the truth is, it, it was less than a legendary effort, okay? But he used his fame of this San Juan Hill and the Rough Riders to, to become the governor of New York, McKinley's vice president, and then the president. And very... Uh, you know, amazingly, what, 100 years, a little over 100 years later, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor in 2001. So, you know, wow. Okay, only because of his post-war career becoming a president is why he got this award. It had nothing to do with the battle. If, if you or, or me, you know, uh, were at that battle and he did the same effort, we would not get the Medal of Honor. You know, it was a pedestrian moment at best. Now, don't don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to minimize warfare. I'm not trying to say he wasn't brave. He was completely brave. He led the charge. He, he could have been killed, but lots of people do that. They don't get the Medal of Honor for it, okay? Uh, I, I respect him for it, but it was hardly a legendary moment worthy of receiving the Medal of Honor, okay? So we talked about modern history and how – you know, this idea of social history trying to present all the facts, giving the oppressed people a voice. Well, the, the, the story about San Juan Hill today, the, the true story, is a regiment of black soldiers called Buffalo Soldiers, 10th Negro Cavalry Regiment, 
uh, have now been given full credit for their part in the incident. Okay, They were in the center of the line, much closer to the danger, and it was their regiment that actually you know, uh, took that, that hill. Teddy was there on the right and was not, not, you know, in the thick of it. Okay. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from Teddy and his efforts, but, but the true heroes here are, are the Buffalo soldiers, these black soldiers. Okay. Um, but you know, until recently, nobody would ever give the credit to a black unit for, for, you know, something so, brave and heroic, okay? Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number seven, okay? Uh, so what am I what am I talking about here? And we're talking about this war and this manhood idea and that, that how it was, you know, kind of created by, you know, the fervor of newspapers. And then you have this incident with Teddy Roosevelt where he's so famous for this San Juan Hill. And in reality, it was not really much of a, of a you know, um, it, it, it wasn't quite the hallowed moment that, that it's it's led to be. He was there and he took part in it, but that's really it, okay? Uh, and of course, the the regiment of black soldiers or the Buffalo soldiers, it turns out that they're the ones that, that actually, you know, held the ground and, and took the day, okay? So uh, the, the, they're the heroic brave ones. And that's how, you know, history sees it today, okay? So it's important to revise history, right? This kind of goes back to the whole point when I when we first started this class. You know, revisionist history is done not not to change, you know, things on truths. It's, it's, to, it's to show truths and, and give people credit that, that were there that, that have not had credit before, okay? Okay, so back to the War of 1898. Okay, so, so first Grover Cleveland, then... Uh, McKinley, two presidents, they they want to stay out of of this war, um, you know, uh, out of this war with Spain. Uh, actually, out of this war between Spain and Cuba. Okay, uh, although Cuba was a strategic location for the United States, and the United States has been trying to get Cuba for so long, and uh, not successful. Okay, so um, so they they want to have a presence there, though. The, the, uh, America decides we need to have a presence in Cuba just, just in case something happens. So they send a, the U.S. battleship Maine <clears throat> down to Havana Harbor. And uh, one night there's an explosion on the, on the battleship. And uh, 266 American men are killed. Okay, uh, And the yellow journalists immediately start pointing at Spain. Okay, and, and the newspapers, you know, praise the chance to go to war. Remember the Maine, another hallowed war cry, like remember the Alamo, Custer's Last Stand, San Juan Hill and the Rough Riders, right? So, uh, so, so the newspapers pushed for every man to prove his manhood and for the country to prove theirs, you know, and, and get out there and, and go fight, go fight these nasty Spanish, okay? So all this rhetoric going on while while 266 men had just been killed, you know, uh, tragically. Okay, so instead of expressing remorse for the dead, the yellow journalists challenged the American men, "Come on, boys, let's go fight a war." Okay, so what I want you to do here is take another break, and I want you to watch the film uh, entitled um, uh, "Where is it? it? It's about the Maine, uh, the story of the USS Maine." Okay. And go ahead and watch that and come back, okay? Okay, so there, there was never any evidence that it was a bomb. Uh, recent underwater studies of the hull of the main, as mentioned in the film, have indicated that it was likely an explosion on board. It had nothing to do with Spain, okay? Uh, so this, this is similar to the Mexican-American War, you know, manufactured to secure the valuable lands in southeast United States. This was manufactured to, you know, go fight the Spanish and, and perhaps gain Cuba, okay? Uh, the, the country was whipped up into a war fervor over this, over this ship uh, sinking. And, you know, even though Spain had nothing to do with it, as has been proven, Nobody in America believed that, and that that that's that pushed America into this war. Okay, so th so this is imperialism and nationalism at its very best. Okay, you're you're mixing the two. Okay, 
Okay, so so the United States declares war on Spain, and they have an they, they uh, add an amendment to the uh, the declaration of war against Spain. Okay, it declared that the U.S. had no intention of taking control of Cuba, and that once peace was restored to the island, the Cuban people would control their own government. Okay, so interesting. Um, you know, this is. Uh, don't don't think that they didn't ever wish they could take that back because they've been trying to get Cuba for the entire 20th century and still have not been successful. Okay, okay. So America starts. America enters this war, and amazingly, the first battle is all the way across the world in the Philippines. Okay, uh, America goes to the Philippines with their fleet, and they destroy the Spanish fleet. So it, it's hard to, you know, wait, wait a minute. I thought we were fighting this war to help the poor Cubans against the, against the, you know, barbaric Spanish. What are we doing in the Philippines? Well, you know, Spain's over there too. So, so America sees it immediately as a way to get more land. Okay. So the, so the first battle in Philippines destroys the Spanish fleet. And if you ever, if you need any evidence about how America thought about the territory is being gained. Here you go. This is from the president, William McKinley. We must keep all we get. When the war is over, we must keep all we get. So leaving little doubt, the United States had an imperialistic motive, okay? We talked before about the Queen of Hawaii, okay? She was deposed by a group of Marines. Uh, came, came there by force, walked in, said, we're taking over, Queen, sorry. And Hawaii became a United States territory, Okay. Congress voted to annex Hawaii as a territory, and of course it would become a state in 1959. So Hawaii is on the way to the Philippines, so it's a resupply point, right, for the American ships. Uh, okay, so back to Cuba. So there's war, warfare there also, but you know it's a it's a it's a small island. It's, there's a lot of jungle there. Uh, so you, so this this war it, it is is called guerrilla warfare. So so what is that? You know, the, the land, the geography is not open for massive battles. So it's kind of hit and run tactics by small mobile groups of irregular forces. This is what what a, a what a army will do when they're outnumbered. OK, uh, you know, outnumbered and operating in territory controlled by a hostile, much larger regular force. So this is guerrilla warfare. Are there other examples of that? Yes. In the American Revolution, George Washington in the north, Nathaniel Greene in the south uh, during this war, the, the, the colonial army was, was, was not capable of facing the British army toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They would have been crushed. And this, they, they, they learned this early in the war at the Battle of Long Island where, where they're, they're completely mowed down. So Washington realizes early in the war, we can't face them. We have to just jump, you know, jump out, hit them and, and get back. OK, uh, so so, you know, kind of hit and run. OK, uh, so this happened in the north and the south in the revolution. If anyone has seen the movie The Patriot, OK, well, you know, horribly inaccurate historically, it really is all about guerrilla warfare, okay? The Civil War, in, in many in many cases, especially in the South, uh, uh, was fought that way also. Also, the Korean War, Vietnam, uh, were, were guerrilla warfare type of battles or, or wars, okay? Okay, so long story short, Spain is worn out and, and they lose, and America wins, and uh, what, what, does, what does America get uh, out of the war? Uh, they gain Puerto Rico, and Guam and the Philippines, as well as, as Hawaii, okay? Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, image here. This is Uncle Sam. Uh, it's, you know, sc school time, right? So here's, here's Uncle Sam with, his, with his, new, his new students, right? And who are they? Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba. These people, these students have to learn to be America, Americanized more than these people. Of course, the white people are all pretty smart and reading their books, and they're, they're all together. You see a couple, one African-American, but, but over here, you see the real role of, of an African-American. It's, 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 you know, ma manual labor, okay? Uh, here you see the, the Native Americans trying to figure out what to do. Should I become Americanized? You know, the book he has is upside down, okay? And then who's out here? You see a Chinese person looking in. He's excluded. He, he, he can't come in, okay? So this is kind of the, uh, you know, idea of who America was in, in that time, okay? Okay. Um, 
Okay, where am I here? Okay. According to McKinley, after the, after the, uh, in, in the Philippines, uh, we could not leave the Filipinos to themselves. They were unfit for self-rule. <clears throat> of course, they've been, they've been, you know, doing okay for a number of years, although under the Spanish. But McKinley, you know, says they're inferior. They're not, they're not worthy of ruling themselves. So we better do it for them. You know, this is a, a an age-old method of controlling somebody. You can't do it on your own. Let me help you. Slaves in the South, you're childlike. They need support, so we'll help them, okay? So much like the war with Mexico in 1846, <clears throat> the United States benefited from a weaker opponent and gained much, and their standing as an emerging world power became more emphasized, okay? So, so again, this is a very ethnocentric statement from the President of the United States, can you imagine a president making that statement today that, that a people were unfit? He would get in big trouble, he or she, I should say. Okay, so, you know, there, there still is some anti-imperialist sentiments very loud in the United States. They argued that, there, no, that no power was given to the government by the Constitution to conquer and colonize. Okay, but they do it anyway. Okay, so this this... This, this Spanish-American War of War of 1898, it, it doesn't last long. It goes pretty quick, and America gains all these lands. But the, uh, the incident in the Philippines kind of evolves, and that ends up being another war, and that's called the Philippines-American War. This goes on for uh, three years, okay? And another three-year guerrilla war breaks out in the Philippines. So America's fight at war for a number of years here. <clears throat> People don't, don't he know about this war, but a significant battle took place here. Over 4,000 American troops were killed. It's a lot of people, okay? But over 100,000 Filipinos were killed. So, you know, pretty, pretty nasty uh, three-year war, okay? And the Philippines then becomes an American territory, okay? Okay, so the insular case is one of your terms out of your book. Uh, what is that? Um, the, the question was, you know, we're, we're gaining all these territories. Do the, do, the, do the people that are native to these territories, do they just become automatic American citizens? So the insular cases said that citizenship was, was not automatically extended so, to people living in areas acquired by the United States. So, so they don't they don't want them as citizens, but they want their land and their resources and their strategic value. But the people gained no advantage. Okay. Okay. The Platt Amendment um, outlined relations between the United States and Cuba after this war. Okay. And we talked about the Teller Amendment that that America would not would not uh, control Cuba at the end of this war. But the Platt Amendment blocked Cuba from entering into any treaties with any other country other than the United States, and the United States could intervene in their affairs, okay? So, so wait a second. The Teller Amendment claims that the U.S. had no intention of occupying Cuba, but here with the Platt Amendment, they're saying that they could intervene in their affairs. Isn't that kind of the same thing? Okay. Okay. But but America really gains here and, and becomes you know much more on the world stage. That's thus the title of your chapter in emerging world power. That this that this is that moment, okay? And after McKinley's assassination, Roosevelt becomes the president. He truly sees the um, United States as the protector of the world, the civilized and orderly powers to insist on the proper policing of the world. So the policing of the world, you know, a, a, a policy that still continues today, uh, the U.S. as the good cop of the world, um, is this an extension of manifest destiny? You, you know, it's hard to argue that it's not. Uh, we talked about this when we had our conversation about Trump and nativism. Can the world leader and the self-proclaimed policeman of the world be isolationist today? Okay, okay so this is where this this kind of... America you know, getting out in the world, and especially the end of World War II, this is where it starts, okay? Are we now going ba going backward by being nativist uh, under the, the ideas of Trump, okay? Uh, okay, um, the open door policy um, came about in this era, and what does this say? Nations, including the United States, had equal access to Chinese markets. So all nations still saw China as the most coveted market all these years later. 
uh, and it was very competitive. Everybody wanted their piece of China. Okay, so the United States, States created this policy to give everyone equal access to China. Okay, and also not allow anyone to gain control of their market. So, kind of a double-edged sword here. You know, they 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 allow people to come in, but only because they didn't want them to gain control. Okay. But the truth is, in the 20th century, uh, in Asia, Japan was the rising power, and they were at the beginning of accumulating power that would be seen in World War II. But we haven't even seen World War I yet, but we're almost there. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's end here for Class 1 of Chapter 21, Lecture 1, and then we'll come back and do uh, your, your next film will be uh, the continuation of this chapter, Lecture 2, okay? Thank you.